Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. The mastermind behind 2611 attack to be extradited to India. A Kashmiri observer claims Pakistan setting up terrorist launch pads along LOC. And violent attacks on Pak Army rising in Balochistan. In a major diplomatic win for India, the US court has approved the Indian government's request for the extradition of the Havar Rana, one of the masterminds behind the heinous 2611 Mumbai terror attack. The Havar Rana is a Pakistan-born Canadian citizen who was an accomplice of David Headley, the chief conspirator of Mumbai terror attacks. We have a report. Despite a number of dossiers confirming the role of Pakistan and terrorists based on its soil in 2611 attacks been presented to it, Islamabad has maintained a dismissive attitude towards its people's role in the heinous Mumbai attack. In yet another blow to its shoddy defence aimed at protecting terrorists, India secured extradition of dangerous Tahavur Rana from the US soil. Rana is one of the masterminds of Mumbai terror attacks. Some say Tahavur Rana's handover could prove to be one of the biggest breakthroughs in India's sustained efforts to bring 2611 culprits to justice. It's a major breakthrough. Because myself and the government of India's three high officials had visited uh, Islamabad and we were very keen to see whether the Pakistan is prosecuting the conspirators uh, who had hatched the criminal conspiracy for the terror attack of Mumbai on 26th November. But Pakistani authorities were asking us to furnish evidence. So after examining David Headley, we have given the entire evidence that Pakistan did not act. But I think this uh, extradition order of Tahaur Rana uh, would help us in many ways uh, for opening the entire gate of the criminal conspiracy. Tahaur Rana is a childhood friend of David Headley, the key conspirator of the 2611 Mumbai terror attack. As per reports, Tahaur Rana was running an immigration consultancy in Chicago, US and had a branch of his business in Mumbai. Tahavur Rana's first world immigration services, running with the name Immigration Law Center, served as a cover to Headley for his surveillance operation. Headley further relayed the information and photographs of the targets to the Lashkar e Toiba, a Pakistan based terrorist organization, for the final execution. David Headley, before the attack, had visited Mumbai. After the attack had visited Mumbai, he had taken the photographs and he handed over the photographs of the targeted places to the lashkar e -Toyba. David Headley was convicted by American court for 35 years. It was a plea bargain agreement whereby it was agreed between the American government and David Headley that he will not be transferred either to India or Pakistan, but he can give the evidence. By using this Plea, plea bargain, we have decided to tender pardon to David Headley and accordingly we have made an approver giving the more detailed scope of the entire criminal conspiracy. David Headley after the plea bargain with the US authorities had also revealed sensitive information regarding Pakistan army and their close links with the lashkar e Toiba. experts say the extradition of Tahavur Rana would further provide some clinching evidence in the case. David Headley had given the sensitive revelation disclosing the close links between the lashkar e Toiba, that is jamaat and that is the uh, that is the pakistan army official david headley has also produced certain email correspondence which was the exchange between lashkar e Toiba operatives as well as the pakistani people so i think the order of the extradition of tahaur is a very clinching uh, would be clinching evidence uh, so far as uh, the further opening the scope of the entire criminal conspiracy. 
On November 26, 2008, 10 lashkar e toiba terrorists stormed into the financial capital of the country and kept the city of Mumbai under the grip of terror for three consecutive days. Terrorists attacked the major landmarks like the Taj Hotel and the Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus railway station as per David Headley's planning. At least 166 lives were lost, including foreigners. Tahavur Rana is an important link in the chain of perpetrators who carried out the most dreadful terrorist attack on the Indian soil. Moving on. Pakistan, which has been perennially engaged in fomenting terrorism across the Indian border, is once again trying to infiltrate terrorists into India. As per the Kashmiri observer, who has been closely watching and following Pakistani policies, said Pakistan was now setting up new terrorist launch paths in the occupied territories when the global attention was fixed at former Prime Minister Imran Khan. We have a report. The terrorist attack on Indian security forces in Punch on 20th of April confirmed the presence of Pakistani terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir. While Operation All Out, which was launched in 2014 to rein in terrorist activities along the border, has been largely successful, Pakistan has stepped up its nefarious designs to keep the region disturbed. The last few months have been particularly violent. Rattled by India's growing stature at global platforms, Pakistanis are once again hatching devious plots. Pakistan's focus of late has been to somehow disturb the Indian plans of organizing a G20 event in Srinagar town of Jammu and Kashmir. Experts say Pakistan has already activated its sleeper cells in India and is setting up new launch pads along the line of control and international border to infiltrate the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. The whole world's eyes are fixed on the issue of Imran Khan arrest, the riots going on in Pakistan, the vandalization and burning down of Pakistan military buildings, the break in the chain of command in Pakistan army where core commanders are refusing to take orders from the army chief, the army is busy doing something else. The army has uh, brought in large number of terrorists for infiltration in Jammu and Kashmir because they are planning that before the 20th of May, before the G20 summit commences, since the arrest of the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, the Islamic nation has descended into political chaos. The world's attention has shifted to this situation rather than its cross-border terrorism. Pakistan Army, which has been unrelenting in its anti-India conspiracies in line with its bleed Indian with thousand cuts policy, is recruiting more and more terrorists. They are planning large infiltration from various points to confuse the Indian security forces on the border and the army on the border and make sure that some of them, although might get caught or uh, not be able to cross the border while others can sneak in. Now I'm going to give you details of the launch pads where they, these terrorists have already arrived. Neelam Valley launch pad, Lipa Valley launch pad, Chukoti, Baksar, Diva sector, Bhimbar, Dera Sher, Khan village of uh, Batal sector, Goi, uh, Brahmach village of Goi sector. These are where terrorists have arrived with full gear, with full supplies for food and logistics and they plan to attack India through infiltration anytime from now till the 20th of May. The Indian security forces have been on high vigil in Jammu and Kashmir 
ever since two major terror incidents in Punch and Rajori. The third G20 Tourism Working Group meeting is scheduled to take place at the Sherry Kashmir International Conference Centre in Srinagar from May 22 to May 24. According to sources, a multi-tier security arrangement has been put in place along the line of control and the international border in Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan, an exporter of terrorism in its neighborhood, the sanctuary of terror has now become a subject of the monster it has created, nurtured and sheltered over the years. Recently, a group of terrorists attacked Pak Army's camp in Balochistan, province of Pakistan. According to official reports, two soldiers and two terrorists were killed in the attack. A report. The situation in Pakistan has grown more unpredictable and insecure in the last few months as terrorist organizations carried out several attacks throughout the country. On May 12, a group of terrorists attacked Pak Army's Frontier Constabulary Camp or FC Camp in Balochistan's Muslim Bagh town. The CCTV footage of the attack showed at least six terrorists holding weapons. According to Inter-Services Public Relations report, two soldiers and two terrorists were killed in the attack. However, Park local media reported rather conflicting figures of casualties and damages. According to the statement of media's military wing, an operation was underway to apprehend the terrorists trapped in a building complex. Meanwhile, the recently surfaced terrorist group Tehrik e Jihad Pakistan claimed responsibility for the attack on the FC camp. Pakistan is paying the price for nurturing terrorists in its backyard. On 11th October 2011, the then US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in a visit to Pakistan famously remarked, that people who keep snakes in the backyard should remember that these snakes will bite them too. Well, that exactly is happening. And the terrorists, which Pakistan had for long supported, are now inflicting casualties within Pakistan. Over the past few months, terrorist groups have carried out consecutive attacks on the police and military forces in Pakistan. According to the Islamabad-based think tank, Pakistan Institute for Conflict and Security Studies, January 2023 was the deadliest month in Pakistan. Provinces like Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan are witnessing a spike in terrorist attacks. According to Pakistan's government report, Balochistan witnessed 13 terror attacks last month. There are also reports that the banned Tehrik e Taliban Pakistan TTP group can forge a nexus with several other rebel groups in the country. Since November last year, TTP has been fighting an ongoing battle in Pakistan against the police and the army. The Pakistani government has been under fire from both domestic and foreign experts for concessions it has made to the Tehrik e Taliban Pakistan. These academics argue that Pakistan's morally repugnant practice of bargaining with extreme outfits legitimizes terrorist goals. The Islamic Republic's successive governments have long toyed with the idea of dangerous religious extremists breeding in Pakistan and promoting the expansion of transnational terrorist organizations. The biggest threat for Pakistan is not its economic crisis, but it is Tariqe Taliban Pakistan. On 31st December last year, Tariqe Taliban Pakistan declared its parallel government in Khyber Pakhtunwa, and ever since, it has been carrying out regular and repeated terrorist attacks in Pakistan. Today, Tariqe Taliban Pakistan has almost a free run in Pakistan wherein it carries out terrorist attacks at its own will. Pakistan has lost thousands of lives in the country, but still, the country has not changed its strategy. 
failing to prosecute several leaders of UN proscribed terror groups and even going as far as to ensure their protection, Pakistan is directly assisting the burgeoning Islamic terrorist threat in the country. Pakistan has long failed to take appropriate action to combat terrorism within and outside of the country. The country is now facing the consequences of its inaction and those suffering the most continue to be Pakistani citizens. Next, we move on to Afghanistan, where the Taliban's tight limitations have crapped the nation. The hardliners have deprived millions of Afghan women of their right to education, ousted tens of thousands of women from jobs, and banned women's businesses and all sorts of activism. They have trampled on Afghan women today and forced them into dark ages. A report. Since the Taliban group stormed back to power in Afghanistan in August 2021, the group has been clamping down on women's rights by barring them access to education and public spaces. In December 2022, these restrictions were tightened with a ban on women working in non-governmental organizations, NGOs. In April 2023, this was extended to local UN workers. Taliban restrictions in Afghanistan, especially the bans on education and NGO work, have drawn fierce international condemnation. But the Taliban have shown no signs of backing down. Over the last two decades, women have taken a central stage in NGOs, in UN work in Afghanistan. But what happened with the coming back of the Taliban, that they have debarred women from all such kind of work including NGOs and now the UN. So this is definitely going to affect because they don't have that kind of workforce. So those, those people who have already trained in those processes, the development activities, now if you remove them, how are you going to replace them? That's a very big question. So that is why this work is going to be affected. It will affect Afghanistan at a juncture when it is facing a humanitarian crisis. The ban on UN female staff from working has hampered efforts to help Afghan people amid a crumbling economy and widespread hunger. According to a recent report of Human Rights Watch, Afghanistan remains one of the world's worst humanitarian disasters. The country's two-third population is food insecure and the situation has further worsened after the ban on women working for NGOs and United Nations. Afghanistan is, a, is on the verge of a humanitarian crisis. Uh, they need a lot of international support. The entire population may go into the poverty cycle very soon. So that is where the Afghanistan is right now. The governance is of, of, of in a very poor stage, particularly because Taliban has not accommodated people who know things well, who worked in the last government they are they know they know a little bit of technical things so that is where the taliban is lacking in the terms of you know using the resources that are available human resources particularly that is available within afghanistan the taliban had promised to respect women's rights when they swept back to power but ever since their return there has been steady streams of setbacks in march of last year the Taliban broke their promise to reopen secondary schools for girls. Two months later, women were forced to veil their faces as well as their hair. In September, Women's Affairs Ministry was disbanded. Thereafter, in December, the all-male interim government ordered all foreign and domestic non-governmental groups in Afghanistan to suspend employing women as some female employees didn't wear the Islamic headscarf correctly. The Taliban regime has failed to earn recognition from any UN member state because of their rigid and intransigent mode of governance. Their inability to transform their mindset on issues such as women freedom. Taliban government should understand that a country can't survive in the 21st century by pursuing a retrogressive and ultra-conservative approach. The eventual outcome of suppressing the freedom and creativity of women will be the erosion of Afghan society. Banning women's movements,
curtailing all their freedom, health and education will augment frustration and anger among the Afghan women. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.